welcome to part three of the subcortex. Please ignore that it says part two. <laughs> mm. Just made a coffee, so you're going to hear me drinking coffee during this, which should be fun. Um, right, the reticular formation. Ooh, the reticular formation. So, here's what you need to know about the reticular formation. The lilac-y colour. Um, so, here's the midbrain. Here's the pons. Um, <laughs> here's the medulla. Here's the pons. And here's the midbrain. Okay, so MB, P, MO. Okay, so this is inferior, this is superior, obviously. Um, this lilac -y colour centrally is the reticular formation. So the reticular formation spans all of the brainstem, right? From uh, spinal medullary junction right the way up to the mesencephalic diencephalic junction. It is a long set of projectile fibres and nuclei that are involved in a whole host of regulatory things, both in the head and for the rest of the body. It is vital for consciousness and a whole other sort of things. And we're going to go into it today. So you can divide with the midline, you can divide the reticular formation roughly into three columns. A median column that's also called the RAF, median RAF, the medial and lateral logically. So three separate columns, one on either side. And these will persist throughout the midbrain, the pons, and the medulla. Um, so, if we drill into them a bit more, the median half is directly parallel to the sagittal plane. The medial one is most of the projection fibres. So, going from the brain stem up into the um, into the cortex, etc., and the subcortex, and then down into the spinal cord. So. If you see a projecting system and it isn't otherwise stated, you can assume that it is the medial column of this reticular formation. And then laterally is the integration of cranial nerves and visceral information. So it's allowing all 12 of your cranial nerve pairs to respond to the interoceptive environment that is that within your body, as opposed to the outside. There are four key functions of the reticular formation and I've written them down here in some detail because they're usually very hard to sort of pass like I did a lot of googling about the reticular formation and read some papers to look at some of the latest research it basically comes down to these four things movement analgesia and stoicism of noxious stimuli so not just pain autonomic processing and arousal okay so if we begin with movement the reticulospinal tract, so from this reticular formation to the spinal region, is from the pons and the medulla, so it's the medial reticular formation, which we know because medial is mostly projection, to low motor neurons. And what this reticular spinal tract will do is to modulate the reflex arc and to be a tonic flexor inhibitor. Right? So it flexor inhibitor. So it's turned off when noxious stimuli appear. So you flex... You with a flexion of your do it now flexion of your elbow moves your hand away from the source that it was at right extension pulls it towards the source right but if you flex will we move away now our reticular spinal tract will tonically inhibit flexion so if we turn off the reticular spinal tract it helps the reflex arc to kick in and it will make it more of a powerful withdrawal. So the withdrawal reflex does require a decrease of this tonic flexor inhibition. So you would turn off this reticular spinal tract. So analgesia and stoicism comes from the tectospinal tract and the tectum is the is a key part of the midbrain that we'll come to in the brainstem lectures. So it's about noxious information that comes to the periaqueductal grey matter. So it's grey matter about the cerebral aqueduct in the brainstem. Okay? It goes to the nucleus raf, nucleus raf magnus. So we know that the raf is another name for the median portion. So the median portion will receive this information. So you've come across something that hurts. Ow. Periaqueductal grey to nucleus raf magnus. And then, this, and then it projects down through the tectospinal tract to the superficial lamina of the posterior horn to block pain, right? So certain cultures where 
you are more likely to have stoic individuals who are much more resistant to pain are shown on scans to have much larger periaqueductal grays and much greater um, responsiveness in their tectospinal tract to inhibit the pain incoming. So a little bit of pain comes in, it goes up to the periaqueductal gray, which is full of opiate receptors, which is one of the reasons that morphine has its effect, because it comes to the peri periaqueductal gray nucleus raph magnus complex to turn on your tectospinal tract. So I want you to think tectospinal tract, it's a stoic person, right? And this will block pain. There has been a lot of research that just by electronically stimulating the periaqueductal gray, you can perform complex operations without any need for analgesia. So, and it is being done actually in research in cats and dogs very successfully indeed. And it tends to be safer in some respects in a lot of the um, the general anaesthetics that we give. So do watch this space. The research in the next few decades for the tectospinal tract will be particularly interesting. Um, autonomic processing, so it's in the medulla and the pons, is interlinked with all the cranial nerves and sympathetic projections, vagal fibres, hypothalamus, so a whole load of things. It includes the pontomedullary, cardiovascular and respiratory control centres, which Ricky would have talked about in um when he's talking about the central the the the, the projection of chemoreceptors and baroreceptors to the ventrolateral medulla that is what this autonomic processing is so it's not just projection fibers there's also processing going on and then arousal so our reticulothalamic and reticulocortical so projecting upwards particularly of the bilateral midbrain transmit diffusely to sustain consciousness and they transmit monoamines, okay? And this is in response to spinotectal and all of the things coming to this, um, this, this region of the reticular formation and telling them about the interoreceptive and exteroreceptive environment. So we're going to go through a few key projection systems here. So the name, we have the locus ceruleus. Where is it? Well, it's near the floor of the fourth ventricle. Here's the fourth ventricle. Here's the fourth ventricle. Here's the medulla. And here's the pons. So you can tell that this is the pons because it has these horizontal fibres that are running to the cerebellum from the descending tracts. And you can tell this is the medulla because it has the superior olivary nucleus here. So two key distinguishing features that we'll discuss more in the brainstem lectures. But near the floor of the fourth ventricle in the pons and the medulla. Okay, this is the locus ceruleus, and it will have a um, profoundly diverse projection. So here we are, and it projects, look at it. So it's going to all of these different lobes and the cerebellum. Now, what can we infer about its function? Well, it's lifeless in sleep, but in wakefulness, it's woke. It's a woke little thing, right? So it's assumed to have a key role in attention and in vigilance. What about the next projection system? Well, we have our dopaminergic systems. So these are mesencephalic for the ventral tegmental area, which is this region of the midbrain. This is the midbrain. Um, oh, hang on. So we've got our, our VTA, ventral tegmental area, which projects from the me midbrain, meso, to the limbic system, to the cortex, the frontal cortex, and the substantia nigra pars compacta which is the negrostriatal pathway. So from the substantia nigra to the striatum, which was the chordate and putamen. Okay, so the functions of each, your nigrostriatal pathway projects from the SNC to the chordate and putamen, and this is decreased in Parkinson's disease and in antipsychotics. Your mesolimbic pathway projects from the VTA here to the nucleus accumbens, Okay, and the nucleus accumbens results in the positive symptoms of psychosis. So your limbic system projections of dopamine cause the positive symptoms. Meanwhile, your mesocortical comes from the VTA again to the frontal cortex. So movement is the remit of the SNC. And the VTA is the remit of your positive and negative symptoms of psychosis, particularly schizophrenia. OK, so it's worth pointing out the fourth one here as well, the tubero-infundibular pathway. So this comes from the tubular set of nuclei, the third set of nuclei in the hypothalamus. Go back to that lecture and projects to the pituitary gland. 
Now, there's an inverse reaction between the dopamine that comes from the uh, the arcuate nucleus of the tubal region to the pituitary gland, the anterior pituitary gland. So if we increase the secretions of dopamine, we decrease the secretions of the anterior pituitary gland's prolactin. Okay? And vice versa. Turn off the arcuate nucleus's projections and prolactin will be secreted. Okay? So antipsychotics block a whole host of things. So in antipsychotics, you get... Um, Parkinsonian-like symptoms, extrapyramidal symptoms, because the negro striatal pathway is turned off. You get a decrease of the positive symptoms of psychosis and a decrease in this pathway as well. So negative symptoms of psychosis are knocked out. And th this is the classic, the, 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 the original set. Obviously, there's a more attuned one in the, the, the alternative drugs that they have now. Um, so, but the tuberoinfundibular pathway is also affected. So a classic stem that you would have of a patient on antipsychotics is that they begin galacteria. So because you've turned off dopamine and the inverse relation, prolactin starts to kick in. Now let's move on now. So our nucleus raph magnus, so just remind yourself of what that is in the brainstem whilst I have a sip of coffee. So it's the median section of the reticular formation. Now, this region, nucleus raph magnus, is from the median line of the reticular formation through the whole brainstem and will, pro and will project um, similarly to the noradrenergic fibres that we saw in the Logos ceruleus. It appears to be about overall level of arousal. There's a lot of serotonin in this region, in, the, in these secretion areas. So the nucleus raph magnus, the, see how midline they are. They're all very median line, no matter where you are. So here is the A is the midbrain, B is pons. We have more pons here, and then we have medulla there. So in all of these different sections here, we have um, the nucleus raph magnus projections. So did you just catch the difference there? So it's very similar. It appears to be involved in overall level of arousal versus attention for adrenaline. OK, so the nucleus raph magnus is more about the overall arousal, so level of consciousness, GCS, versus attention, focusing in on something very specific. So my overall level of consciousness is more about the NRM in the median line, whereas focusing on a finger and drawing my attention to it or paying attention to this lecture, which of course you all are right now, is the remit of the, um, the locus ceruleus projection system. And the fourth one is the cholinergic systems, which come from the basal forebrain. It comes from the basal nuclei, the nucleus basalis minute, which is this region here. And that's why a lot of people don't like to call the basal nuclei, your caudate, your putamen, your subthalamic nucleus, um, your globus pallidus, these different regions here. They don't like to call them the basal nuclei, even though they are nuclei, because a cluster of cell bodies in the central nervous system is a nucleus. It's not a ganglion. So they can't be ganglion by anatomical definitions. But we still call them that because just inferior to the lentiform nucleus here in this line are the basal nucleus of Maynard, which is a cholinergic projection system between the orbitofrontal cortex and the hypothalamic nuclei and the cholinergic reticulothalamic tracts which involves these. So these tracts go to the hypothalamus and they go to the orbital frontal cortex. They're involved in sleep-wake cycle learning and memory. So just have a think. What is one of the drugs that you give um, uh, patients with Alzheimer's disease? It is um, an anti-ACHE, so acetylcholinesterase. So it prevents the breakdown of ACH because the cholinergic pathway is involved in memory. And that moves the arc of disease progression in Alzheimer's. Obviously, it does not cure them. It gives them about six more months of um, good quality life. So you do the odds if that's worth it. Um, I think most people would say it is. That's not the remit of anatomy lectures. <laughs> but that's the role of the cholinergic system, sleep wake cycle, learning and memory. So um, the limbic system now. So we've talked a lot about the limbic system already. I do just want to draw your attention to a couple of things. So we've already mentioned this subcolosal area and the cingulate gyrus previously. We've mentioned the parahippocampal gyrus and the uncinate paraterminal gyrus. Almost no one talks about that. I would not worry about that at all. There is a sort of isthmus, which is a narrowing of the cingulate gyrus as it becomes the parahippocampal gyrus, if you care about that at all. 
So my question to you is, what is this region here? And what is this region medial to it? So why don't you go and have a think about what these different areas are, because we have talked about them before. So the subcloastal area here. So again, we have our corpus callosum, our anterior commissure, lamina terminalis here. And then here's the olfactory tract. So we have the olfactory bulb, olfactory nerve projections. So the tract here is coming into and projecting into these regions. This subcolosal area in green or in this reddy colour here is implicated in depression. It's anterior to the lamina terminalis, which is the anterior hypothalamic border. So here's our hypothalamic sulcus, our thalamus, our interthalamic adhesion, our fornix, our septum pellucidum, and our corpus callosum, our cingulate gyrus. Just to worry on yourself there. And notice how this olfactory region projects here. So here's the uncus. So what's this little structure? It's the amygdala. Which is why when you smell something, before it gets to higher cognitive conscious areas, your amygdala is activated. And that's the primal, like, evolutionary sense of smell. Olfaction is vital, right? It's vital. So smell, oh, you can be repulsed by something. You know, they do a lot of behavioural research. Pa uh, patients. Uh, persons are more likely to be a, of a conservative disposition and reactionary in their responses if a room smells of garbage. They are much more likely to vote of a liberal disposition if the room has been cleaned beforehand and smells fragrant. So react, and that's uh, th this all talks about free will and things. So let's let's not open that door. But the connection between the limbic system, in particular the amygdala, and the olfactory system is very interesting. So it's often called the fifth lobe. Uh, it's comprised of the orbitofrontal cortex, the hippocampus, the insular cortex, the cingulate cortex, and the parahippocampal gyrus. So it's sort of a loop and the 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 mesial temporal regions. Olfactory, uh, the orbitofrontal cortex is smell and memories. Your hippocampus is long-term memory and long-term potentiation. Your insula is desire, addiction, craving. Your cingulate, especially the anterior cingulate gyrus, is neuropathic pain network. And then your parahippocampal gyrus is uh, cortex to hippocampal regulation. Okay, so it's how, it's the remit by which the cortex, uh, the cortical hippocampal fibres um, help regulate. I'll just put this in here because it's important to be able to distinguish all of those curving subcortical structures. So we have our fornix, our fimbri, our hippocampus. We have our lateral ventricles, the interventricular foramina of Monroe into the third ventricle, into the cerebral aqueduct and the fourth ventricle. And that will project down to the central canal of the spinal cord or move out to the subarachnoid space and the, 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 the cisterns via the uh, foramina, the medial and lateral foramina, which are Magendi and Lushka, eponymously termed. So we have the fornix, the thimbri, the hippocampus. We've got the chordate, which looks like a sperm, um, the head, the body, and the tail of the chordate. Add it to the putamen, you have the striatum, and you're starting to think about spotter questions that could be asked. What is this structure? What else comes together to form the striatum? We have the cingulate gyrus here and the parahippocampal gyrus, all continuous with each other. So the... Okay, so th this is basically a summary of what we just said there, and the connection between the hippocampus and then the um, hippocampus... The uh, the fimbri, the fornix, the amygdala. And just remember, the amygdala is deep to the uncus. So remember that. It's really important. So a little bit now about the hippocampus. You might want to take a break here and make a cup of coffee um, as we delve into this. So in green here, it is the hippocampus. So it lies in the temporal lobe in the floor of the inferior horn of the lateral ventricle. So let's just go back and find the ventricle system here. So here's our lateral ventricle, okay? And here is the um, the temporal or inferior horn. And so the hippocampus sits on the floor of this. So if you find this little ventricle, then you'll find the hippocampus. And sure enough, here, here and here, they're sort of together, aren't they? Sort of superimposed together. Um, da -da -da. So yes, so hippocampus here, this serrated area that you can just see there is dentate. 
the dentate gyrus. We have the subiculum here, parahippocampal gyrus, the inferior or temporal horn of the lateral ventricle, fimbri, fornix coming forward. Right, so this is the fornix. So the fornix is comprised of columns, of a body, and then of crust. And remember what crust means. Uh, go to your etymology for that. Basically means legs. And then the hippocampus here. So here's your hippocampus, hippocampus, hippocampus. And then look, so if we have the hippocampus here, we have the, the crust or the crew. We have the body centrally and then the columns either side and look at this interesting thing here the anterior commissure that we've mentioned before connecting the temporal um, lobes together is intimately involved with the fornix here's your anterior commissure here's the column and then the central body of that fornix and if you follow it back you will see body coming together coming together and then the crust running off either side here. <laughs> but that's that's kind of in the weeds. I wouldn't worry too much about that. And then here's a more sort of like um, keen arrangement here. So we have our hippocampus, our fimbri, our fornix, the mammillary bodies here. Remember, memory mammillary bodies. Corpus callosum here. Internal capsule up here. Septum pellucidum will bridge between here. So remember we said fornix, corpus callosum. Between them is the septum pellucidum, and that's what that is. So hopefully you're slowly building up this 3D picture. So we have, this is now the hippocampal complex, which can be a bit complex for people, but I, I want you to think of a couple of structures here. So here is the choroid plexus. So it's the ventricles choroid plexus, right? If we go most deep here, we have the dentate gyrus. And remember where we saw that dentate gyrus previously. We then have this sort of like wrong way round S shape. You know, if you think of an S like this, it's sort of a wrong way round S shape. Kind of looks like the British Heart Foundation logo, doesn't it? Um, so the hippocampus is divided into three different regions. CA they're called. OK, and this is about the cornu, which means horn. Amun. So remember the um, Amun, who was like the, the I'm going to really butcher this now, like the, um, well, yeah, it's not horrendous. I mean, I, I can't draw to save my life, but he was sort of like the, so when you were, he was like this, this god of the, or deity of the underworld in ancient greek it's been a while at uh, greek egypt it's been a while since i've done any fucking egyptology so i wouldn't worry too much about that um but he had horns and he had this sort of like horn complex thing <laughs> so the cornua mum so ca because it kind of looks like his horns to board early anatomists and it's divided into three or four normally three or four so ca one two three four basically so we have the hippocampus with the cornua mum then we have the subiculum and the entorhinal cortex. And this is all embedded in, para, in the parahippocampal gyrus. Because remember, the gyrus is an abutting. So if we have a sulcus down here and a sulcus here, a big abutting of cortex would be a gyrus. So here is the, um, the parahippocampal gyrus because it's para next to the hippocampus. And it's formed of the subiculum and the entorhinal cortex predominantly. Okay, and that's the rough structure of the hippocampus. So the whole of the ways that we can view it, so just to make us think of it, it's flipped the other way now. So we have our dentate gyrus here. We have our hypothalamus here, which will have our um, CA regions within it, one, two, three, and four, like that. We have the subiculum here and the entorhinal cortex here. So that should be a key indication to what that all looks like now. So dentate gyrus. So the, so here we are. So here's a sagittal section. If you cut this out and sort of tuck this area here and blew it up, you would see the optic tracts here, the chordate nucleus here. So the chordate nucleus, yeah. Don't worry too much about the fact that the chordate nucleus is there because remember there's the head and then it arches round. So optic tracts, chordate nucleus, and then we have your dentate and we have the CAs. 
CA1234, we have the subiculum, and then we have the entorhinal cortex, and together this is the parahippocampal gyrus. Okay, so three to four, it's very variable and it's subjective as to where they put one, two, three, and four. People have tried to define it, but it's very loose. And actually this arrangement can be quite variable, but this is the main um, structure. So comprised of, oops, of the dentate gyrus, yep, the hippocampus proper, and the subiculum. So if you just remember this reverse S shape, this, this snake-like thing, and you'll be fine. So CA4, 3, 2, 1, subiculum, enterhinal cortex. And together we have our parahippocampal gyrus. Yep. And then you need to be able to see it in this section as well, which is a beautiful section here. So here's our lateral ventricle. So we have our um, different structures there, just to make you feel a bit better. So uh, we've already mentioned all these before. So subiculum, CA4321, dentate gyrus, uh, parahippocampal gyrus, your antroinal cortex, um, subiculum. Um, so this is the classic trisynaptic pathway both afferent and efferent. So the entorhinal cortex tends to be the thing that brings information into the hippocampus, and it does so via a pathway called the perforant pathway. Now, we did briefly see it on this gorgeous old um, Netter illustration here, because the perforant pathway is this pathway here. So here's our subiculum and our entorhinal cortex here, and there's a perforant pathway into the hippocampus and the dentate gyrus there. So... If I, oops, if I go back here, we have entorhinal cortex, perforant pathway into the dentate, and then it will go to CA3 and then to CA1, then to the subiculum, and then either to the fornix via the fimbri or straight to the cortex. So this is the classic trisynaptic pathway, and there are different names for the different types of neurons that project in these different pathways to different sections but this is the classic afferent and efferent flow of the hippocampus okay if you're struggling to locate the hippocampus in your mind just think of this illustration here you come across this many times with your corpus callosum chordate lentiform nucleus down here so your hippocampus is in this region here and if you imagine the S shape like that, this is where that is, okay? If you're still struggling, this is a really good video, a really good video. That's it.